Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Informed and Engaged, which is a weekly conversation about the ideas and the solutions that are changing the media landscape. The inaugural episode of Informed and Engaged kicks off with a crucial conversation that meets the moment, but is long overdue. Here to introduce today's guest is Lashara Bunting, Director of Journalism at Knight Foundation. Thank you, Jennifer. In the past two weeks, we have seen dozens of journalists of color share their personal stories of racism in their news organization. And as a result, we've seen the resignations of several high level editors. For today's show, we're going to go deep into this moment of reckoning in journalism and explore what news organizations and publishers and news executives can do to dismantle the systems of racism that exist in their organizations and within journalism. We have a powerhouse lineup today. With us is Martin Reynolds, co-executive director of the Maynard Institute. Sarah Lomax-Reese, she is the CEO and president of WURD Radio in Philadelphia. And Mitra Kalita, senior VP of news opinion and programming at CNN Digital. This is going to be a great discussion. So for those watching, whether you're watching it on Zoom or on Facebook, please use the platform that you're on to submit questions. We hope to get to those toward the end. And with that, Martin will kick us off. Thank you so much, Lashara. And thanks to the Knight Foundation for uh, putting this conversation on. It's very, very important and very uh, well needed. So I just want to start the conversation in this way. So like the nation, journalism is at an inflection point. The pandemic and the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Richard Brooks in Atlanta over the weekend, and a seemingly endless list of black men and women and people of color has continued to lay bare the deep racism and white supremacy and health and wealth disparities of our nation. This at a time when many newsrooms themselves are in crisis. Some of that crisis is financial, but there are two other crises of our own making that we must face as a profession a lack of trust and a lack of, and a systemic lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Really at this moment, the soul of American journalism is at stake, particularly for legacy institutions. And as a profession, we must reconcile that we are part of the very system protesters across the nation and world are pushing back against. And I'm speaking of the larger we, as there are certainly sectors of news and instances of coverage that run counter to the oppressive systems that people of color and indigenous folks have to navigate. But we must ask ourselves, and I'm borrowing from a Dr. Glenda Wren here, who's a physician, not a journalist, and she talked about people needing to ask themselves, are they sustainers, creators, deniers, facilitators, or dismantlers of systemic racism? And at the very least, news organizations have been sustainers and facilitators as we have run police mugshots full of black and brown faces, knowing they drive page views. We've co-created with police departments, giving their reports and quotes more weight than we would the account of a woman from the community. And we've disproportionately cast black and brown folks as criminals, as victims, derelicts, entertainers, and athletes for decades, helping to shape the perception that black men in particular are dangerous. Our communities, and other communities were simply ignored their erasure, a silent and insidious facilitation of racism and white supremacy. So how do we meet this moment? How can we push forward and show the value of inclusive newsrooms that work in service of a craft to which we have all dedicated our lives? The Maynard Institute has been fighting to make America's newsrooms reflect the diversity of the nation since nine diverse journalists started this organization in the wake of the Kerner Commission report, the report that called out news outlets as complicit in their inability to effectively articulate the true stories behind the unrest of the civil rights era because mainstream news organizations lack diversity. And ironically, if you read this report today, you would wonder if much progress has been made. So much is still yet to be done and we are navigating another kind of civil rights movement in this country now that centers around health and wealth and state sanctioned violence against people of color. The framing of our challenge within journalism has been rooted in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And quite frankly, these are terms that don't actually get at the real problem. 
And I don't mean to imply that people working in news outlets themselves are racist, although some may be. I'm speaking of the generational ambient racism that permeates these institutions and can be seen in how we approach coverage and hiring and retention. But it goes beyond who's in the building. For instance, how many black police chiefs have been at the helm of departments that commit violence against communities of color? How many editors of color have been unable to affect the kind of sweeping change that reflects a dismantling and institutionalized racism because one's presence isn't enough to make the kind of functional and foundational change that is necessary. There is a movement in these streets and there needs to be a movement in our newsrooms, but I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because as I look around the nation and I see journalists of color and their allies pushing back and calling for change, and I have two fantastic guests to help contextualize this. And Mitra, I'm gonna start with you. So before joining CNN, you were managing editor for editorial strategy at the LA Times and you're a woman of color, a leader who sought to bring forward innovative approaches to covering topics such as black Twitter, for example. And this uh, was a specific example of the kind of editorial shift that can begin to add nuance to coverage of communities of color. And while important though, some may argue that uh, it, the creation of any sort of beat is really just a tweak. And so stepping outside your role uh, at CNN, how do you see this moment? for legacy institutions. So I want to begin by thanking you, uh, personally, Martin, thanking you, because the Maynard Institute and the Kerner Commission Report has everything to do with my own career trajectory, uh, but also to Knight for hosting this. Um, and I admit that I feel a little sheepish about uh, being here uh, because mm. for the last few weeks, really the message I've been trying to get out is that there is a need to center Black voices right now. But mm -hmm. there is a need to center Black hiring, Black retention, Black promotions, and the rest will follow. Um, so to begin with me, I just want to acknowledge that because if you take anything away, you know, that has been my mantra. That being said, to your point, um, there are few of us in the executive ranks, right? right? And the burden of representation I've always seen as one that is inclusive uh, mm -hmm. in every sense of that word to essentially pay forward the path that was paved for you know my family by being able to be in the United States. And I think that segues a little bit to what you're asking about um, at the LA Times, where you know I, as the managing editor, one of the first moves I made that got a lot of attention was hiring a correspondent to cover Black Twitter. Right. And I imagine right now, a lot of newsrooms are having a similar conversation around how do we cover race, right? Should we launch a race and identity team? Should we have a race beat if you didn't have one? If we have one, how are we covering it? Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of um, positives that came out of what I was trying to do at the LA Times, which was shifting how we see beat coverage, right? Can we be in the community that we're covering? Um, certainly when it comes to police violence, so much of it was playing out on social media. So the thinking around a beat like that was, um, can we be a part of the community that we cover as a way to improve coverage, right? LA um, County is about 9% African-American um, and the city of Los Angeles, uh, I believe about 10%. The LA Times newsroom was less than half of that, right? Mm -hmm. So this was a, a quick way to immerse ourselves in the community that we're covering. Um, we hired someone who you would call a non-traditional candidate, right? That's that's the term that we use in the newsroom. The PhD candidate, Dexter Thomas, um, just got his PhD, and now he's a correspondent for Vice News. He's a phenomenal journalist. That's all the good stuff. The bad, I think, is what we're talking about today, um, is how do you keep this from just being uh, cosmetic or kind of, I think, where you're going with it of, is this just like a tweak in beat coverage, right? right? Um, what I didn't think about was how do we manage um, to amplify his voice? What is the copy desk? Uh, what's the role that they play in some of the terms that we use in the use of video? Is this going to be labeled opinion, an article, or analysis? Which I'm sure I, I know this. I, I can't see anyone who's tuning in, but this is an eternal struggle in newsrooms of what do we label coverage of race, right? Because it's coming from the perspective of an African-American who's known on Twitter. Um, and many of the fights over the last few weeks have been, um, been, been over this exact discussion. Um, so I think 
you know, to sort of wrap that up, I think we're sick of diversity being a tack on subject. Um, that if we are going to augment our coverage, it actually, we need to look at the entire system within which it exists, including our copy desk, our headline writers, the editors that are um, editing this copy. Um, because otherwise, if we're not rethinking everything about how we're covering this moment, then this moment will feel like every moment that came before it. And it's not going to the, be the movement that everybody is hoping that it really is this time. A quick follow-up before I go to Sarah. So stepping sort of into your role in, at CNN, are these kinds of systemic questions being discussed? Because I think to your point about, for, for those of us who have sort of been in the business a long time, sort of having a beat uh, that was focused on a particular issue or topic felt like a win, right? Yeah. But now, what we are seeing is that it's still functioning within this larger system and the gaze in which journalism is framed, right, and pushed out is still from within this institution. So I'm wondering within CNN, what kind of conversations are happening and are they at the systemic level? I would say they are. I mean, Jeff Zucker convened um, small groups, large groups pretty much right away. And, and these conversations have been ongoing around coverage. I think over the weekend, some of this was put to the test, right? Because we had uh, the incident at the Wendy's in Atlanta um, that you mentioned. And you could just see a shift in the conversation around it. Um, you know, are we profiling Brooks? Uh, his daughter turned eight yesterday and she was supposed to have a, a you know, she planned to do a skating party, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's that conversation right away of not just, um, I think what, you know, historically, it's like the unarmed black man, right? That's sort of the, the, the catch-all. Um, that we right away went to fuller portrait and humanization as a conversation, I'm going to say as a step forward. I think mm -hmm. the conversation that really we need to be having is the role of police reporting, accountability, um, you know, journalism and the use of phrases like the authorities said, like we are in a very, um, you know, I would almost say cozy relationship with police and police reporting. And this is historic and this is entrenched in how we commit our journalism. I think those are going to be ongoing conversations. I do assure you that within CNN, they definitely are occurring. Okay. Thank you, Mitra. Sarah, I want to turn to you. Uh, I imagine from where you sit, you have a bit of a different perspective. And I have been on calls with you and you are considerably more direct uh, on issues related to diversity. And I've always appreciated that. As president and CEO of the only black owned talk radio station in Pennsylvania, you hold a unique perch to look at these issues. And you're a grad, you have a graduate degree in journalism, you sat on the Lenfest Institute board, and you're now a table stakes coach for the new major metro cohort. And for those who don't know what table stakes is, Knight Foundation for about five years has been funding a framework to support performance driven change in newsrooms, such as around growing subscriber revenue and other transformational uh, initiatives. And so as an outlet serving the black community, Sarah, how do you see this moment for American newsrooms? And have you given some thought to the kind of counsel that you will give the journalists that you're gonna be working with as part of this Table Stakes Initiative this year? Sure, well, um, thanks, Martin. It's great to be uh, in this conversation with you and Mitra and a big thanks to uh, Jennifer and Lashara for having the courage to have a, a, a really frank conversation about um, systemic racism, which is something that um, is not new at all to anyone in the black press, in the black community. And so it's, um, it's, it's refreshing, quite frankly, that uh, this, this deep systemic um, blight on America is finally um, being discussed in a way that I've never seen before mm -hmm. in my life. I mean, this is right up there with President Obama getting elected. I never thought I would see a black man get elected president. And I never thought I'd see the day where mainstream white led news organizations were having uh, really thoughtful and um, deep conversations about anti black racism. And so that to me and and 
you know, um, as a black media organization, as a, a, a black talk radio station, WURD, we are having these conversations all the time. Um, we are talking about police brutality. We're talking about uh, the underfunding of public education. We're talking about healthcare disparities, all of these things. So, so in a way for me, it's, um, it's a little bit uh, frustrating that there's like this, oh, wow, we need to do something about this, this, this like surprise, surprise. And to me, what that indicates is, you know, the world either thinks black people are inherently inferior or dumb or criminal, or that there is actually systemic racism and that, that, that there is a real problem because there's no way that you can just be waking up to the fact that the media is complicit in systemic racism or that all of these other systems exist because it is, it is so obvious that black people have been oppressed systemically for 400 years and it's manifested in politics, in the economic structure, in public education, in healthcare, in every system that exists. And the media has to start looking at itself as one of those institutions that is complicit. And what's interesting is um, at the last news guys, we had a similar topic about the, the media's complicity in um, promoting or um, protecting white supremacy. And so I love the fact that, that Lashara and Jennifer and the Knight Foundation is, is having this even larger conversation. Um, so, you know, the, the, to me, the, 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 the challenge is that this is a great, I mean, there's, 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 it's always a good time to have this kind of conversation it's always a good time for the newsrooms and all of these systems to begin to really reflect deeply about their, um, their role in, in uh, this, this kind of white supremacist racist system. However, it's also even more complex at a time like this where everyone is so um, dialed in and, and very focused on this. It's hard for media organizations who do not have the trust of the black community. They, so, so this notion, I hear a lot of people saying, we've got to rebuild trust with, with, uh, with the black community and with communities of color. No, it was never there. It was never mm -hmm. ever there. So it's not a rebuilding process. It's, it's actually a repair. It's, it's a digging out because mm -hmm. it's not even like you're, you're initiating a, um, a, a, a relationship of trust there is a history of damage and stereotyping and caricaturing and, and demonizing black people in white led media organizations, as you mentioned, Martin, in your, in your opening. And so there is like, like very deep, you know, someone, um, uh, a, a spiritual teacher that, um, that I, I am very fond of says that, that racism is a heart disease. It's a mm. disease of your heart. And so that is a much more like I can, I can lay out a bunch of things that I think newsrooms should do in terms of addressing this kind of complicity in systemic racism. You know, obviously at the top of the list is you have to have uh, people of color in positions of power in these media organizations. You have to have, and I will say black people, because the, the, the thing, and I've said this to you, Martin, you know, in, in the fault lines structure, you know, all fault lines are not created equal. Right. You know, like, like, like the, the, the fact that black men and black women are the ones who are being murdered in the street, and then these police officers are exonerated or not, never charged or whatever, that is a very specific thing in this country that happens to black people. My three black sons, I have to try and arm them in, in the most you know, ridiculous way so that they can navigate a, a system that, that is almost in, unnavigable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, so I, I don't wanna just keep going on and on because no, I, okay. I, 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 I have there, there are a couple of things that I would say have to happen in, in newsrooms. Um, I do think that Diversity at the highest um, at the highest level. I really believe in ownership. I am mm -hmm. a believer that the ownership of a media organization 
matters because if the ownership is uh, understands these issues and understands that it's not just about window dressing, it's not just a, uh, a something that they got to do to to make themselves look good in the moment and then they can get back to business. That matters. Um, I know as an owner, you know, we I, my family owns WURD, and that is um, we that gives us the independence and the autonomy to really represent the people. And, mm -hmm. and so that's the other thing. These newsrooms have to center mm -hmm. their coverage on the people. They have to value, and I would even say love the people. You know, that, mm -hmm. that is something that, that we don't talk about as journalists because there's supposed to be this, you know, this objectivity and this, this. But if you don't see yourself in that community, if you don't see, like when, if you don't see your child as, as um, you know, uh, you know the the Emmett Till or yeah. or uh, Rashad Brooks. You know, if you don't see, if you see no connectivity mm -hmm. in the humanity of these people that are being shot and killed because they're them, and that it couldn't even, you can't even fathom that touching your life. That's a problem because that speaks to the fact that there is not a, a real full embrace of our full humanity right. of black people. So I think I'll pause there because I have okay. some other like specifics, yes. but I think I'll pause there. And we may be able to get to some of those specifics in questions that people uh, bring up. So this is really to both of you, a little bit of context. So we've seen younger journalists of color pushing back now against management in a number of newsrooms across the country, right? In Philadelphia, the executive editor resigned following the Buildings That Matter to headline. Uh, the Newspaper Guild of Pittsburgh uh, is calling on leaders of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette to step down after two black journalists were barred from protest coverage. And actually one of them, Michael Santiago, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist, actually took a buyout and so is now leaving the publication. And one of the things he said during a panel that we were on last week was that, this is to your point, Sarah, that I don't want to work at a place where I'm not loved. So it's, when you said that, it really st stuck out at me. Also, ABC News is having its own problems as uh, Barbara Fedita, there was a report in Huffington Post about insensitive comments uh, when discussing Robin Roberts' contract. Apparently, Fedita was heard saying that it's not like ABC was asking her to quote, pick cotton. So in conversations, and, and also in conversations I've had with other news executives across the country, there are newsrooms tensions right now that are percolating that could really spill over into some very public messes for news outlets. And so what's also really interesting though, is that this outrage is being fueled by younger journalists to a great degree. And so I'm curious as to what each of you make of this widespread internal journalistic activism and if you think that it could ultimately lead to systemic change and what are the implications for this for our business if it does not if these changes are not made and uh, Mitra, why don't we start with you and then sarah sure, sure. i mean i should say that i'm uh, very grateful for a younger generation that's that's not just challenging um i i would say they're white editors but they're challenging folks like me who are journalists of color but came of age in a certain system, a certain way of doing things. So um, I just, I welcome the, mm -hmm. um, I welcome what is happening right now. And I think just for the watchdog nature of it, right? There are so many editors who are on guard right now because mm -hmm. their entire past is being um, in some ways on display. And so for people like me who've seen folks just ascend and we all know that feeling where you're like, based on what? Because you knew this person who knew, you know, or right. you, and, and we've all watched this. Um, and so one, you know, the, my first reaction to the folks who got dismissed was what about all the people who they might've stepped on along the way up, right? And so there is an element right now of potentially, potentially writing uh, what has happened that I mm -hmm. welcome. And then again, to challenge even journalists of color within the system on how we do things and why, um, I think is something our industry needed to do long ago, right? And mm -hmm. I think this actually relates um, immensely to what you're asking of like, well, will it, will it work? Because I don't wanna be a downer, but um, I think you need to look at the history of change in journalism, right? Like until just a few years ago, legacy organizations still didn't wanna post stories on the internet 
before they put the newspaper to bed at night, right? Forget diversity and journalism. They weren't even willing to change how we do things mm -hmm. for the audience that is clearly not consuming your newspaper, right? So right. I, I, and I, I do link those two things because I think our future is at stake right. in what yeah. you're describing. I think our revenue models, to Sarah's point about ownership are at stake. I think all the people who've rushed to nonprofits over the last few years, I think right. the diversity in those ranks is, I mean, I think that model is at stake. I think uh, whether we succeed in our fight as publishers against platforms and trust issues on Facebook, I think that connects back to the need for us to be more inclusive. So mm -hmm. I, I want to be clear, and, and my hope of the people who signed up for this, because I've heard it's like, like more than a thousand, which is more than any diversity talk I've ever been to. My hope is that a lot of them <laughs> are white journalists who realize that this is the linchpin, right? This is not something we've been talking about for fun. This actually has everything to do with our success, not just as an industry, but I would say as a democracy. I, I truly believe that. I think that's really well said. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that it constantly what ends up happening when you go to a conference, right, the diversity conversation is, 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 <laughs> is, is being had by people who already know it's valuable. And it has never really been tethered to survival, right? It hasn't been tethered to growth and sustainability. It's been increasingly tethered to trust, uh, which Sarah alluded to, that, that in communities that represent audiences of the future, often so often that's been frustrating is how these audiences are cast as underserved. No, they're the audiences of the future. So to you, Sarah, what do you make spread, what do you make of this widespread activism? And do you think that this could finally ultimately lead to systemic change? And what are the implications if it doesn't? So I um, I am so uh, excited about the the activism that I'm seeing from younger journalists and younger people in general and and I do think that you know at least on on our airwaves it's um, there is an intergenerational component to this as well it mm -hmm. is it our you know our listenership because it's a talk radio format skews older and they are like older revolutionaries they are like all in and they're they're excited about the 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 activism that that they're seeing um in the streets by by younger people and and so you know but i always think that there's there's there needs to always be an inside and an outside game mm -hmm. you know so i i i applaud um young journalists and i think that young black journalists are following in the footsteps of kind of um black media pioneers you know like the freedoms journal in 1827 was was started by um samuel cornish and john b russworm and these are black men in 1827 who were advocating for the dignity the humanity of black people this is before slavery was was ended and and so you know i think that for black journalists this this notion of not participating or or taking um having being like compartmentalizing yourself so that you're not fully engaged in what's happening right i think it's beautiful and it's necessary for these institutions to understand that these black reporters and reporters of color are not reporters first they are people and human beings and they are struggling with the same uh racial disparities and and with both within the institution, within the organization, but also in the larger world. And so they are bringing their, um, their, their activism into a space that needs it, needs it deeply. And right. so in terms of the future, I think that, you know, um, if, if, if this is not a real reckoning and, 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 you know, a movement, not a moment, as, as some people say, if this mm -hmm. is not used um, as as a an opportunity to, you know, just like COVID nineteen, everybody had to pivot. Everybody had to pivot. You know, like like you, if you weren't fully digital, you had to get digital. This is the same kind of thing. If if we are not looking at this in 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 a way that allows us to reimagine and reconceptualize what journalism and and and. I, I was going to say white-led, but I'm not even going to say that because I don't think it should be white-led media anymore. 
Right. But but it's it's also something that's going to take time. You know, this mm -hmm. this whole dismantling of this this system is not something that's going to happen overnight. And so I think that one of the things that I would say to the the audience, to to anyone who's listening, is that um, you know it took us four hundred years to get here, and so all of this desire and urgency to connect with black communities and communities of color, it's, it's going to be a real long-term process and investment. And I hope that publishers and, and editors understand that, that um, they cannot do anything that even you know, has a whiff of inauthenticity and, and a whiff of um, just trying to placate and just trying to survive this moment. So they can like get back to 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 business as usual. Right. If they do that, I think the the whole thing collapses. That's interesting. Uh, and to your point about um, folks bringing them their whole selves, the thing that stood out to me as it related to the situation that was going on in Pittsburgh was that you had Alexis Johnson who sent out this tweet with these photos and said, "Oh, look at this looting. Oh, just kidding. It's uh, it's a it's a concert." And then. Santiago, who now has left the, the paper, uh, one of the things they talked about was wanting to be at a place that loved them. And so there's, what I'm interested in both of your perspectives on is that news organizations have not been great places to work, particularly mainstream news organizations for a long time. They've been extremely toxic. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges, obviously a lot of struggle, a lot of just, you could argue organizational PTSD that many across uh, the sector, particularly in newspapers and others, have had to navigate. And I wonder how that impacts the ability to change and evolve. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And then another thing speaks to, Sarah, what you were talking about, which is bringing one's whole self, right? This notion of objectivity. The reason that these folks were pulled off the story was because the paper asserted that they were then, quote, biased. But the reality is none of us are objective, but yet it seems that in many journalistic circles, this notion of objectivity is still something that is in the air. It's certainly what we were taught when we were coming up. So I'm curious as to most of your thoughts in terms of the environment in which journalists have to operate writ large. And if you think that the notion of objectivity should really be permanently eradicated and, and uh, that this notion of fairness should much be focused on considerably more. Uh, Mitra, why don't we go to you and Sarah, then I'd like to hear sure. what you have to say. I actually, you know, I, um, I've generally used terms like impartial, fairness, accuracy as the foundation of my journalism. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that they are similar to objectivity, and I think the, the focus right now, um, I would almost go back to a term you used um, when we started talking of gaze, right? Mm -hmm. Whose gaze is the measure of whether this is even fair or accurate, right? So if we're right. gonna move away from objectivity, it doesn't mean that impartiality, fairness, and accuracy still gets us there because there's still the mm. question of whose perspective are we judging this by? Right. And so for me, it's really been um, an education of newsrooms as well as myself of looking at stories and our interviews and then our own management of our people mm -hmm. through that lens, right? Of what is possible, what is missing. Right. Um, I think Sarah's framework of loving is beautiful. I mean, I think I, I've, I've never, um, I've never used that term when it comes to the folks on my team or the audience. You know, we talk a lot about compassion in journalism. We talk a lot about bringing emotion to our work. Um, but there's something about what Sarah just articulated that makes me think even before George Floyd's death, we were contending with a crisis in journalism of a different type, which was coronavirus, and the inability of the newsroom culture, Martin, that you're talking about to even manage around that, right? There are a lot of managers where the pressure of checking in with someone who sees them as their end all be all when it comes to human connection or community or, I mean, that's a, that's a stressful experience, right? So certainly newsrooms, I think, have been having some conversations that lead into this idea of loving that I'm gonna steal from Sarah, um, mm -hmm. which won't be the first time I've stolen an idea from Sarah, she knows that. Um, <laughs> Because that, that, that really does connect also to, is our goal to uplift our communities, right? Is there a belief in our coverage, our people, our content? Like it sort of all comes together. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then the, the last thing I'll say, and I'd love to hear Cyrus' thoughts on this, is also that I think our, our, we've had a preoccupation over the last few years of mistrust, and we've really allowed that conversation to be framed around the right, right? How can we get, mm. you know, usually it's like Trump voters to trust media again. And yeah. I think one takeaway from this conversation, and Sarah said the same thing of, there might never have been trust right. among audiences of color or black Americans of mainstream media, right? So if we don't have it on the right or the left, then we're, we're, we're really, I mean, that is a serious issue and that's something that we're gonna have to work on um, mm -hmm. way harder. Right. Uh, Sarah, I want to go to you and then we'll open it up. I'll throw it back to Lashar to give us some questions. But Sarah, we're really interested in your thoughts on this. So reframe the question for so me. So the question being, so the, the notion of how do you think the gaze, I'm just going to go right on in on this way. How do you think the gaze needs to change in order for news organizations to actually see and love their people and the communities that they need to serve? I mean, I think that, that it's, you know, it's um, each person who is covering uh, a, a beat or uh, something has to really do their own internal work. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's where Fault Lines, Fault Lines comes in to, to help news organizations um, diagnose, you know, what, mm -hmm. what needs to be worked on. But this is really deeply individual work. I would even say it's deeply spiritual work, quite frankly, right. you know, not to get too like, like woo woo love and spirituality and all of that stuff. But, but right. honestly, I think that this, um, this moment that we are in, you know, coronavirus like stopped us all in our dead in our tracks. You know, young people are, you know, are, are home from school. They're, they're, not employed because of either, you know, for whatever reason. And then we witness these horrific things on video and they are, they have time and they are on fire and they just unleashed this movement that, and they're like, oh, we are showing up every day. We're showing up every day because this thing needs to be dismantled now. And, and so I am like deeply encouraged by that. But I think that, that every person of every age needs to do some deep um, introspection about mm. their gaze. Like who is in your network? You know, do you have black friends? Do you have, I mean, black people, I will tell you, have a PhD, most black people have a PhD in how to navigate whiteness. You know, we're, we're, I, I can't tell you how many, how many panels, how many, you know, boards, how many, everything. I'm like either the only black person or one of like two or three. Right. And, 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 and I am sophisticated enough to be able to navigate that. But you flip that script, there, the white people are often not allowed, I'll say, given the opportunity, I'll say to be in spaces where they have to navigate blackness. Except as a media person, as a as a journalist, they might they might parachute into North Philly or West Philly and you know mm -hmm. cover something. But but are they are they able to um, not just have a gaze, but have an understanding, mm -hmm. have an experience, have you know authentic connectivity with uh with with people who are not like them mm -hmm. and so and 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 i um i just deeply deeply appreciate the the opportunity that i have to to run and and um operate wurd because it is really like a purple unicorn you know there are not hardly any black owned talk radio media organizations that are really for and by the people. It's it's really an opportunity for black people to speak and be heard in their own voice every day about all of these issues. And that is cathartic. It is um, It provides a space for people to celebrate, to argue, and to just be human and just be, be beings. Right. And so, so I think that we need more of that. We need more of that in 
in spaces that are not just black spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Lashara, I wanna throw it over to you so we can open it up to our audience. Yes, so we have a dozens of questions for you guys. This is a great <laughs> discussion. Um, so if we can keep, you know, the, the answers as, as sort of uh, quick as we can, I'd love to get through at least a few of these. Um, I just want to piggyback on um, sort of your last point, Sarah. There was a great question uh, from Candace Portman on how can we better promote and build Black media ownership, because I think that is really a key part of, of this, right? We talk about gays, it shouldn't be, this conversation shouldn't just be from the lens of working in a predominantly white um, news organization. Yeah, so I'll try and keep this short, you know, but, but um, Candace, thank you for that question. And I have to say, um, when I got onto the board of the Lenfest Institute, that was my mantra for the entire time I was there ownership, black ownership, like let's, cause you know, three years ago, and I'm not saying I was the only one talking about this, but three years ago, I swear, any conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion was about how do we diversify white newsrooms? How do we get more black and brown people into, you know, the Inquirer or here, or the New York Times? And I was like, yo, you know, like, like there's a whole other conversation that has to be had around empowering black ownership because that really creates a kind of agency, a kind of um, independence that you are not gonna get in a, in a predominantly white organization. So how do you do it? One, I am like really you know, pleased that some of the, the philanthropic, the journalism philanthropic organizations like are starting to you know, um, provide resources to black and brown owned organizations. The Borealis um, Foundation just started the, the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund, um, which is specifically for or, uh, media organizations that are owned or led by people of color. Um, you know, the, the, the Night Lenfest, they are doing in, at, um, uh, in Philadelphia, there's a whole effort to empower the entire media ecosystem, not just the the white led organizations, but to really look at what are the, the, the uh, media entities that are serving communities of color that need to be supported. So I think that the, the journalism philanthropy entities are starting to really put some support um, behind it. I know that, that Lashara and Jennifer has been, have been incredibly supportive of me and WURD, and I'm like, I'm super grateful for that. But I think that. Um, that the the and we're a for profit. We are not a not for profit. And so that was another thing. I was like, look, if 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 journalism philanthropies or these different groups like Google News Initiative and you know these different entities, if they really want to address this diversity issue, they have to stop only funding nonprofits. You know, because a lot of black media organizations, especially the legacy ones, are for profit. And so if, if, if that is like the firewall, if that's gonna be the, 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 the rider, or, you, know, the, 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 you know, the thing that keeps you in or out, then you're not gonna have the diversity that you're looking for. And so I appreciate the fact that a lot of these philanthropic organizations have, have kind of you know, taken that off the table and recognized that for-profit community you know, media organizations that are doing the work, serving the community, deserve that support from the philanthropic community as well as um, the, the the nonprofit. So that's one that's one thing that's encouraging. I think the venture capital that whole route it's hard as hell, and I just think that um, you know, word is particularly fortunate because my father was very successful as an entrepreneur and was able to to fund the the WURD for many years when it was losing lots of money until we were able to figure out a model that was able to take us into a space of, of break even and profitability. But it, it, you have to have runway. And a lot of black organizations do not have any runway. Sorry, I took way too long, Lashara, sorry. No, that's an, it's an important question. Um, and so we've gotten a couple different versions of the same question. How do you keep diversity efforts from being cosmetic? Um, and, and what are some real tangible strategies um, that you guys have found or have seen that works in news organizations that, um, that go from uh, that cosmetic change to real systemic change? 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I can't stress enough the leadership and the, the change I've been able to be most effective at is when I'm not the only one at the table, right? And so my own hiring of leaders who report into me, as well as those who are above me, there's incentive, I think, for the organization, for those structures to actually be diverse. So for those of you who are embarking on plans for diversity and hiring, it needs to be at all levels, not just your entry and not just at the top, right? I, th- I think it's also just laterally. Do we have a team with only one black staffer? Is it possible for us to embrace the whole self of someone if they're the only one and not um, empowered to speak, right? So I think mm-hmm. I think that's one. Um, the second, I think, is to, in some ways, the segues uh, from the last question of uh, not reinventing the wheel when there are people who've been doing this work for decades, if not hundreds of years, right? Um, you know, I was, I was telling Sarah before we started that last week there was a trend of um, supporting Black-owned businesses and there was the parallel trend of uh, diversity in, in white newsrooms, which she just mentioned. And I was like, I'm going to become a member of WURD, which I thought I already was, but I wasn't. And so we can support organizations like Sarah's that have been doing this forever, right? And it's a way for us not to um, kind of be like the Johnny Come Lately of you know race coverage by partnering with these organizations. I would also say, the last point I'll just make on local, right? So there's been a real big push around local news. And I'm finding, um, you know, in my own neighborhood of Jackson Heights in New York City, um, the Latino press, the Bangladeshi press have been also here for decades doing a great job covering my neighborhood. And that is just absent in all of the discussions around what we miss, because the we in that sentence is, is clearly not Bangladeshis and Latinos, right? So I think that's another um, thing to look at. Can, can I just add one thing, two things? I think other things to make things, to make sure it's not cosmetic. Um, I think compensation should be connected to um, diversity outcomes. You know, people should, you know, when you tie people's money to this stuff, it, it has a whole different different kind of, of uh, resonance. And I think that the whole thing, if you don't measure, it doesn't matter. There has to be metrics um, built into these organizations in order for, there to be a measurement to, of, of, of success and progress. And the third thing I would say is, you know, these media companies, I know a lot of uh, newsrooms are strapped financially, but, you know, they have professional services, they have catering, they have event services. There's a lot of money that is spent in these media organizations, and they should look at their diversity, their supplier diversity. And I think that, that, that making sure that money that is being spent is being spent with Black and brown organizations is also an important part of the, the, the you know, um, going beyond kind of um, window dressing. And Lashar, I'd ask to add one point to that, which is it can't be seen as just a nice to have. You have to tether the growth and sustainability of these institutions to these audiences that they have not served. And to also understand that you cannot show up with a bouquet of roses after decades and decades of ignoring any erasure and mischaracterization and thinking that they are going to embrace you. You have to ask yourself and say, and my my co-executive director, Evelyn Sue said this so well, which is say, you need to say to these folks, we want you to be our customer. And if when some, when, when someone, when you want someone to be your customer, there is a whole series of steps that you take and approach that you take to make that so. And I just think that news organizations need to think that way in order to build those relationships. We'll go through one final question, um, looking at the time. You know, we've had a couple people in the um, Q&A ask about the role of journalism education. Um, you know, what role can J schools play in the dismantling um, and what can they be doing differently? Mm. Well, I, well, go ahead, go ahead Sarah, please. No, no, uh, I was uh, just going to say curriculum, yeah. uh, that they have to begin to infuse the curriculum of this. And I think the good thing is that you have young folks 
who care deeply about this already in their midst, right? They're already considerably more sophisticated and there's a level of expectation that folks are gonna be more culturally competent than they are. And when they often step into news organizations, they're like, why is this conversation still happening this way? So I think there, but that being said, the, le the level of geographic segregation that has occurred has led to many students showing up to diverse environments that for the first time or stepping into very homogenous places for the very first time. And, and so I, colleges and universities need to infuse this in themselves because they themselves are institutions of racism, right? And there's so many microaggressions that occur. So that, for instance, USC Annenberg School uh, has infused fault lines in the curriculum. So I think approaching, really taking a social justice lens to their journalistic curriculum and how do those two come together can be a great way to start. Yeah, and I also think that, um, and, and this is in the newsroom as well, like who are we holding up as experts? Who are we holding up as um, you know, models of, of success that uh, journalism students should be emulating or should be learning from. And so if you never hear about a black media outlet or you never hear about black journalists who are doing exceptional work and, and it, or you hear maybe it's, it's one thing, but how like really dissecting the entire curriculum and looking mm -hmm. at every component of it making sure that there is, you know, authentic rep representation of diverse experiences and, and mindsets and cultures all the way through, not just, oh, if you take this particular course, you're going you're gonna to get it, but everybody else misses it. I would just um, say two quick things. One, there is a pipeline of failed white male media executives directly to teach journalism schools. And I think we have to stop that. I, 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 really, I really think that that is a part of the problem. The second thing I would say is that much of the both sides-ism that we've discussed over the last few weeks of, I'll make this phone call and I'll make this phone call and I'm good. That is also kind of traditionally taught in journalism school. Most of us in newsrooms know that it's nuanced that makes something a story, right? We wouldn't be writing about it if it wasn't nuanced. And so I think that um, ability to teach um, that it's not two sides is a, is a fundamental challenge to the way J schools operate right now. Uh, but I, I would love to see what they come out with if they kind of, uh, you know, switch up formats in that regard. Um, I was just put this one final question. Um, what role could platforms play in fostering equity and diversity in journalism and helping to dismantle these systems of racism? You mean platforms like Facebook and well, first of all, okay, and this is all I'm going to say, diversify your damn staff and leadership platforms. Let's start there. Shit. Excuse me. Oh. I told you it would be a lively discussion. Uh, Martin, you know, what you got? I'm trying, I'm thinking oh, on well, this, but. I mean, I, that's the thing. That's the exact same thing I was thinking, which is that, I mean, if the organization, if the tech companies don't reflect the div massive diversity of the, their users, you know, what they are creating, how they're approaching the creation of it, you know, bad data in, bad data out. So I think it, it's, they have a similar problem as news organizations, right? Because they are lacking diversity. And as a result of that, uh, the products in which they are creating and the way they are interfacing with community, uh, casting community, uh, are very problematic. So I think the, the place to start is exactly where Sarah said. And, and also understanding that it is essential for news organizations and platforms to be working together collectively. And that's begun to happen with some of the overtures that these institutions have made to supporting the institutions that they utilize so much of the content. But in many respects, you know, I don't want to sort of poke fingers at the at the at the platforms because to a great degree, I look at news organizations as being we are at fault for the position that we are in. Lack of innovation, unwillingness to change and embrace technology has put us in a position where we are in many ways coming to these platforms in a way. Uh, that we really shouldn't have had to. And that's unfortunate. 
I think um, I'm just going to do a wish list for the major ones. Google, the SEO algorithm, as you might imagine, works in CNN's favor. Um, I would like us to reward depth and um, community, right? And I think that's something that just from an SEO perspective, Google uh, should be able to work on. Facebook, I would actually reiterate what I said about J schools, the embrace of nuance, right? Facebook very much is polarizing and who it targets and the content it targets and the reality of um, issues and audiences being way more um, complicated than they're giving us credit for. And then the last Twitter, uh, protect women and people of color on your platform, please. That's it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Martin, Mitra, and Sarah for this, this great conversation. You each have done so much to lift up the cause of equity uh, and diversity in journalism. And as we've heard today, there's still a lot of work that needs to continue. Well, we appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone, please join us at the same time next week when in partnership with the Online News Association, my colleague Paul Chung will be joined by Amy Webb and Sam Guzik to discuss shifting technology trends in the age of COVID-19. Thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>